Okay, so in the last two episodes of Telegraph Tuesdays, uh, we've been on a whistle-stop tour through the history of telegraphy and telegraph machines. Uh, the aim is to give you a little bit more context so we can talk about some of the cool stuff that we got around the museum. Uh, very kindly, some people in the comments have asked for some more detailed videos, uh, and we'll definitely be stopping back at... Uh, points along the timeline of telegraph history in future videos. So even on this quick whip through uh, telegraph history, we've already seen loads of uh, ingenious devices that people have come up with to send messages over distance, uh, electromagnetic switches, binary code, punched uh, data, uh, keyboard interfaces even. So now we're gonna explore how uh, all those ideas come together to create a machine that relatively unchanged for about 100 years will be the way that people send uh, telegraph messages and leads us into the computer age. So it starts with a guy called Emile Bordeaux, a Frenchman, and uh, he developed his own telegraph system, which was inspired by the Hughes printing telegraph. Do you remember the one with the piano style keys? And uh, his had attachments that could also uh, print the code the special Bordeaux code that he came up with into plain text that was easy to read. And that code, the Bordeaux code, is really what he was remembered for, developed in 1872. So today we'd call that Bordeaux code a five-bit uh, code. It had five binary elements that could represent up to 32 different characters. And he also came up with a clever way of expanding it so that it could represent more characters by introducing special letter and figure shifts. It's quite easy to understand because we still have a shift key on our modern keyboard. So when you press the shift key on this keyboard, it's going to print the percentage sign instead of the five. A similar type ID. You've got two sets of characters for letter and figure shift. Bordeaux's mechanism didn't use a keyboard like this. It had five piano style keys uh, to send the code down and a distributor wheel that scanned across the keys and sent either the on or off signals down a single wire. So in essence, that rotating distributor is a parallel to serial converter. So you don't have to have five wires sending the five different code elements. You can send them all down one wire. The trade-off being, of course, that you have to send them sequentially. So it takes a little bit longer. And correcting currents would get sent down that uh, wire as well so that the distributors at both ends were totally synced up. So this setup of scanning across the five keys can be expanded so that you're actually scanning across multiple sets of uh, keyboard inputs. So you can actually have multiple messages sent by multiple operators sent down the same wire. Very clever. It, today we'd call it a, uh, what is it, a time, a synchronous time division multiplex system. Uh, and these ideas of cramming more and more data down a single wire are going to develop uh, as we'll talk about later. So as that distributor uh, wheel uh, turns, all of the operators have got to uh, keep in sync with it and keep to a strict rhythm, which you can imagine is uh, quite tiring. And uh, so the code itself was also uh, designed to uh, mitigate uh, the operator fatigue. And still to this day, we actually call the rate of data transfer the board rate, and that comes from Bordeaux. French patent laws made sure that Bordeaux couldn't actually uh, protect the code itself, the idea of the code. He could only patent the mechanism of the machine. And that was lucky for us because it got picked up by a guy called Donald Murray, who developed it further. So by this time, the QWERTY keyboard that we're all familiar with had been developed for uh, type writers, uh, QWERTS in Germany, of course, Azerty in uh, France, and uh, Murray's telegraph machine used this type of keyboard, which was much, much easier to use than those piano style keys. And uh, what it did is you type in, it perforates a tape uh, just like Wheatstone did with the Morse, if you remember. And then you can send the tape through a transmitter. It sends the code really quickly, which minimizes the time that you use in the network, which means that the telegram provider can send more telegrams and make more money. So it's a really good system, isn't it? So here is the code punched onto a paper tape. Uh, you can see here the little holes. They are the uh, sprocket feed holes. So they would engage with a toothed wheel in the machine, which would pull the tape through the machine. Uh, the bigger holes are the data holes. Um, and you can see there's five 
data holes. It's a five uh, bit code. At least they would call them bits now, but back in the day, they would refer to them as holes or spaces or impulses and non impulses. Uh, and running this way, the correct period uh, terminology would be uh, channels. Uh, so originally these would have been sensed uh, mechanically with uh, springed uh, switches. So you'd have a metal spring on this side, a metal spring on this side, the tape would run through. And where there was a hole, the springs would make electrical contact. You could tell that there was a hole, but uh, later on in the 1940s, they used uh, optical photo sensors, which were a lot quicker. So this would go through the transmitter and at the receiving end of the line, a printing mechanism would print out the message or make a perforated copy of the message on tape. Piano rolls actually use air to sense the holes. We're gonna be looking at that in a few weeks. So because the operators aren't getting so tired using this machine, uh, Murray was able to arrange the code so that the uh, characters with the fewest punch holes uh, could be assigned to the most frequently used letters in the English language. Uh, so just like uh, Morse code assigns E and T to a single dot and a single dash, uh, the single hole uh, codes in uh, Murray's code were assigned to E and T and the two hole codes were assigned like this. U's actually used more than Z, but he got pretty close. There's no computers in these days to analyze these things, remember. He also added control characters like line feed and carriage return for the typewriter-like printed mechanism. We haven't yet talked about Western Union, a massive company founded in 1851. Uh, Main business, of course, being sending and delivering telegrams. And they also pioneered a load of new technologies like telex and telegram-based services like wire transfers. Western Union liked Murray's code, so they adopted it and after a few little changes like adding a space and a bell code so that it would alert for incoming messages as well as some region specific uh, characters like currency signs and that uh, ITA2 uh, international telegraph alphabet number two was introduced in 1932 which became a standard internationally as you get from the name the control characters were symmetrical or uh, in pairs, so that if you put the tape in the wrong way, it didn't really matter and it didn't damage the equipment. Uh, for example, the figures is uh, 11011, letters is 11111, uh, and space is 001000. So uh, they're invariant, and uh, the uh, carriage return and the line feed, they're kind of inverted from each other and they're generally used as a pair, so it doesn't matter which order they come in. The letters code, which is all holes, um, could be used to overpunch characters, so like a delete. Little hand punch editors like these were pretty common for correcting mistakes. They're rare as hen's teeth now, are pretty cool objects. You'll see here these little pips line up with the sprocket holes. Just put that on over, put this down as a guide there and you can use this little punch just put it on through there and there you are you've made a hole the tape itself comes on a reel like this and you can hear yeah that's really tightly wound on there and you can see this tape here has been used to test a machine because it's got alternating r's and y's r uh, is space hole space hole space and y is uh, hole space hole space hole <laughs> Oh, these things are a lump. Ah, and after a while, uh, teleprinters like this Creed 7B started to appear. And these would see widespread use in pretty much the same form, although uh, more electronic than mechanical, up until about the 1990s. Uh, and a lot of the original teleprinters were connected on direct lines from uh, customer to factory, for example. So many teleprinters. <laughs> So many things to fix. Yeah, but after a while, uh, teleprinters like this appeared with telephone style dials, and you could actually connect these over the telephone network, which uh, made things a lot more connected. Of course, people had loads of fun with this technology as well. Uh, when they were bored, this for example, can you see that's Yogi Bear. Compliments of the British Army. Clearly the guys in the Royal Signals got a bit bored one day. By the point of Murray's telegraph machine, we've already got uh, transatlantic uh, telegraph cables. Um, and we need to talk about the development of radio telegraphy as well. Massive, massive development uh, came about when Heinrich Hertz 
discovered radio waves in 1886. We've got an awesome collection of radio equipment in the museum, uh, but of course, the first radio transmissions weren't audio, they were telegraph messages. Edouard uh, Branly, uh, pretty sure that's not how you pronounce it in a French accent, uh, developed the radio wave detecting coherer. This is a capsule of metal filings between two electrodes. When a radio frequency is applied to it, the metal particles cling together or cohere, yeah, reducing the resistance and allowing a bigger current to flow through it. You can then use that current to activate something like a bell or like a Morse paper tape recorder. Those metal filings in the coherer needed to be reset after every uh, signal. Uh, so you had a little electromagnetic uh, clapper tapped it and separated the uh, filings every time. And those coherers remained in widespread use until when they were replaced by more sensitive uh, electrolytic and crystal detectors. That leads us to uh, Mr. Marconi, who in 1895 developed a practical radio communication system using a spark gap transmitter to send Morse code. And by December 1901, he'd actually transmitted across the Atlantic Ocean. Those simple spark gap systems got improved by representing the two uh, elements of the code as two different audio frequencies. This is called uh, frequency key shifting and uh, doing that you could not only send the messages across the airwaves but you can send code through a normal telephone line and so the modem uh, that you might be familiar with which is a modulator demodulator was invented because of the need to connect the teleprinters over the phone so Bordeaux Cosmo up there on the shelf, uh, that's exactly how he works. He listens through uh, the phone line to the code that's sent by this minicom here. Have a little listen. Yeah, that's Bordeaux code being sent over audio. And before and after those five sequential code elements, there's a start and a stop bit that helps the machines to synchronize and prep ready to receive the messages. So if you've got the holes and spaces of the telegraph code represented by two different audio frequencies, then you can shift that audio frequency around and assign each telegraph machine their own slot within the overall bandwidth of audio frequency. And uh, so that way you can send multiple messages from multiple machines over the same wire at the same time, which was Bordeaux's aim uh, with his uh, distributor wheel. But working much better, you can send way more messages now. This was achieved first of all with resonators, which we have here in this uh, telephone exchange that was taken out of St Pancras uh, railway station. Uh, so what happens, uh, they've got little like springy bits in these resonators and when you send an audio signal down the wire to it and it's tuned exactly right, those wibbly wobbly bits will shift around and they make a connection. And in this system, it's used to ring a bell so that you can tell if someone's trying to call you, but they could be used to send telegraph messages. And so this system of splitting uh, frequencies and stuff uh, is called frequency division uh, multiplexing. And being able to send many different frequencies at the same time was uh, a reason why people started to believe that it was possible to send the complex audio signals of telephones. Over the years, the bandwidth of frequencies that you can transmit has grown so much that you can actually send millions of simultaneous messages down a fiber optic cable at the speed of light. Teleprinters found use as terminals, that's input and output interfaces for early computers and program information used to get entered by punched tape. And it was only really when magnetic forms of memory and CRTs started appearing that they started getting replaced. But they were still being used for quite a while with CNC machines. So after the limits of ITA2 Bordeaux-Murray code was reached, they expanded it to an 8-bit code on a wider tape. This is ASCII. Uh, so this is the American standard code for information exchange. And nowadays, computers use Unicode, which is capable of representing over a million uh, characters, including emojis. But the first 128 characters of that are the same ASCII set.
that. So Bordeaux's original code was not actually in use on anything other than his original machine with those five piano keys. Uh, so ITA2 is uh, somewhat incorrectly sometimes referred to as Bordeaux code, but I don't mind that. It's nice to keep repeating his name. You will have heard Sam talking about Bordeaux code uh, in his marble machine video. Well, now you know what it is and you can imagine how that can be fun. I mean, the marble machine can actually talk to us. Phew, that was quite a packed series of videos, wasn't it? And we only just really scratched the surface. Uh, we've gone from semaphore to fiber optic. Wow. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed uh, learning a bit about electronic mail before uh, emails. So as you know, we're in the process of uh, fixing and preserving all of these amazing machines. And if you want to help us do that, uh, there's a link in the bio to the Patreon where you get lots of uh, lovely treats for being subscribed. Uh, we're actually opening on Wednesdays during the summer. Uh, so come along to that and you can support us with buying sample packs as well. Um, so thank you very much uh, and I will see you next Tuesday.